Um, and that living legend is actually with two capital L's. So Windsurf is officially a li living legend from the US Library of Congress. Um, something yeah. that uh, he shares apparently with Steven Spielberg, Muhammad Ali, and Big Bird. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and right. Uh, <laughs> and Romney didn't get to kill Big Bird either. So no, that's, that's, right, that's right. Very relevant, very timely. Um, as you all know, Vint is one of the genuine fathers of the internet. Um, something that he, a, a title that he earned along with, uh, with Bob Kahn. Uh, together they had designed and then wrote the documents for the, the original TCP IP uh, suite of protocols. And uh, what you may not know is that he did that while he was an assistant professor here at Stanford. That's right. Um, and uh, so back in 72 to 76, that was the state, absolute state of the art for networking and what would become the internet. Of course, no one knew that's what it would become. Um, and you know, the rest is obviously a well-known story. He moved to DARPA after that, and DARPA was the, the sort of the center of action for both funding and for innovation in, um, in networking technology at that time. He moved to MCI. Um, MCI then turned into obviously an enormous part of the internet infrastructure. <coughs> and um, so it's as if creating TCP IP wasn't enough, um, Vint has done a lot, lot more than that. And um, he isn't just a living legend for TCP IP. He's helped create a huge amount of the ecosystem that supports the internet today. Uh, he's been involved in the establishment of ICANN, um, which is the, Interne uh, the International Corporation on addressing, um, you know, I've just spaced out on this, addressing numbers and names. And names and numbers. Right. Is it names and numbers or numbers and names? Yes, that's correct. <laughs> protocol, protocol. <laughs> Uh, Some collection of those four things. Yes. <laughs> um, and, and was on its board until uh, fairly recently. This has defined a lot of, of uh, uh, what we take for granted now as the, 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 the names, the numbers, the addressing that holds all of the internet together. Um, in addition, he's been involved in many other things. He testified before Congress on network neutrality, um, helped be a constant vigilant uh, protector of openness for the internet. And yes, you know, his legacy is largely TCP IP, but uh, for sure the creation of and the maintenance of, a, of an open ecosystem to allow for not only economic growth, but political growth of the internet and, f and, and for the internet to be a, an engine and a, and, and, and a piece of political change around the world and freedom and, and, and uh, uh, protection against censorship. He's received almost every imaginable honor and award. I won't even go down the list. Um, other than both President Clinton and President Bush uh, awarded, awarded him um, uh, medals for his, for his work. But the, probably the most significant ones were the awards that are known as the Nobel Prizes of Computer Science, the Turing Award, and the Japan Prize um, in recent years. But the list goes on. If you, uh, if you look anywhere online, it goes over several pages of all the awards and <laughs> honorary doctorates. Um, truly earned the, the, uh, the title of, of living legend, without a doubt. So um, his hard work has come at a price. Um, as far as I can tell, he spends at least 50% of his time on airplanes. And in fact, when we were discussing in preparation for this week, it's just an offhand comment to Phil and I that, oh yeah, I'm in Baku, Azerbaijan right now. Uh, I'll be flying in on Sunday in order to give the talk. So he, was, he arrived in San Francisco less than 48 hours ago. And I know that he's given a whole bunch of different talks and uh, things since he arrived. Um, so he comes today to us today as president of ACM, the biggest professional uh, body for, for computer scientists, and chief internet evangelist from Google, a title which I think is the coolest title in the whole <laughs> world, and we should all be very jealous of. So it's my great pleasure to present to you one of my heroes, Vincent. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, I'm going to wander over here and assume the lecturer position. Um, I should tell you that I didn't ask for that title at Google. It was actually kind of amusing that when I uh, joined the company, they said, what title do you want? And I said, well, how about Archduke? <laughs> <laughs> and you know, Larry and Eric and Sergey say, well, you know, the last Archduke was Ferdinand, and he was assassinated in 1914. <laughs> it started World War I. Maybe that's not a good title to him. 
So they, why don't you be our chief internet evangelist? So I thought, well, that sounded pretty cool. And what is it? And he said, I don't know. You make it up as you go along, which is exactly what we've been doing. And just to give you the flip side of this, I was in uh, London not too long ago in a meeting with the Telecommunications Committee of the House of Lords. And they asked about the title, too, and I told them this story. And when I got to the part where I said, and I asked for Archduke, they immediately understood. I mean, there wasn't any question at all about why that would be an interesting title <laughs> to have. And, and then they said, but he was assassinated in the, right, okay. So here's what I'm gonna try to do uh, tonight, in addition to trying to answer some of your questions. Let me warn you ahead of time, I'm particularly disabled uh, at this point. I'm hearing impaired normally, as it is. I wear hearing aids. I have a 65 dB loss in both ears. But I had a cold when I left Azerbaijan. And when I landed uh, in a big uh, A380 thing, um, uh, my ears went to hell in a handbag. So I can barely hear anything right now. So when we get to q and A, I'm going to need help from, sure. uh, from somebody to uh, interpret. So it's not because. I hope you don't, I might be stupid, but it's, I'm not hearing you. It's not because I didn't understand. All right, so I'm going to try to give you a little glimpse of the background of Internet and then kind of get to where are we now and the opportunities that lie before you, which is why this is called Reinventing the Internet, in spite of the fact that the design was done almost 40 years ago, literally in, uh, at the beginning of uh, 2013 uh, is the 40th year of the design. The network was turned on in January of 1983, so it'll be its 30th an operational anniversary in January of next year. In spite of all that history, and in spite of where we are now, there's still lots that can be done to adapt and evolve the system. And I want you to understand that, because I don't want you to think that you're just looking at a system that was designed a long time ago and it can't be evolved. In fact, there's plenty of work to be done. Some of the things that Nick and his colleagues have done demonstrate that there's plenty of work underneath the network to be done, and the open flow is a very, very good design. I'm very proud of the fact that so many good things have come out of this university. If you, if you just look at Silicon Valley, at the significant companies that have been around, and look at how many of them are directly uh, out of Stanford University, starting with the Hewlett Packard, but now you get to uh, things like Cisco and Sun and Google and Yahoo, and it just goes on and on. And now uh, Ansira and everything else. So let's go back in time, though. This is what the ARPANET project looked like in December of 1969. ARPA, the Advanced Research Projects Agency, was started by uh, President Eisenhower in 1958 in response to the Russian launch of a satellite, the world's first artificial satellite in October of 1957. And a lot of people were disturbed by the fact that the Russians had managed to launch a satellite before the Americans had. And it wasn't just the fact that we tried and hadn't done it yet, but it was also the fact that it suggested that they, if they wanted to, could launch an intercontinental ballistic missile with a, uh, a nuclear warhead. So the Advanced Research Projects Agency was started first to get us into space and second to avoid technological surprise. By the time uh, the 1960s rolls around, uh, an idea called packet switching, which had been explored by Leonard Kleinrock at MIT in mathematical form with queuing theory, and Paul Barron at RAND Corporation in the form of a uh, re resilient communications network for command and control and by Donald Davies at the National Physical Laboratory in the mid-1970s as a means of computer communication, who invented the word packet, by the way. Those three people led the field in pushing packet switching. Um, ARPA decided that it would build a network to interconnect the computers that it was funding among about a dozen computer science departments around the United States. Every year, they kept asking for the latest world-class computer to do world-class research. And even ARPA couldn't buy a new computer every year for 12 different universities. So they said, we're going to build a network and connect them together. So the purpose of this ARPANET initially was not only to prove that packet switching technology was a uh, superior alternative to circuit switching, but it was also to form a resource sharing network so that the computer science research groups could share each other's computing resources and potentially each other's software. So I was a graduate student at UCLA at this point in 1969. I wrote the software to connect something called the Sigma 7, which was a Xerox data systems machine, to the first packet switch of the ARPANET at UCLA 
These devices were called IMPs for Interface Message Processor. Well, the Sigma 7 is in a museum somewhere, and some people think I should be there along with it, but here I am. <laughs> that network uh, worked spectacularly well. And because it worked, ARPA said, well, this suggests that we should really try to use computers in command and control, but what were the implications of that? Well, first of all, if you're going to use a computer, assuming it was portable, uh, in serious command and control, it had to work in mobile vehicles, it had to work uh, in ships at sea, it had to work in aircraft. And although the wireline ARPANET worked very well, attaching wires to tanks and connecting them together that way doesn't work very well because they run over the wires. If you try to connect the ships that way, they tangle up the wires and they get all knotted. So you needed radio. So the first thing we did was to develop a mobile packet radio network. The thing you see in the upper left is the notorious packet radio van, which is at the Computer History Museum. So if you haven't been to the Computer History Museum near, uh, you know, just uh, uh, at the shoreline exit of 101, you should go and see not only the van, but see their 18 or 28,000 square foot exhibit on the history of computing from 2,000 years ago to the present. It's a spectacularly good exhibit. So this van was riding around in the Bay Area. It was run by SRI International. They uh, were testing the uh, packet radio system in mobile operation. So we'd be going up and down the Bayshore Freeway, radiating packets all over the place. Sometimes we'd pull off to the side of the, of the freeway and measure the shot noise and the interference coming from cars that were driving by. There's a, there's a story which might be apocryphal, but it's worth telling anyway. Uh, the driver, of course, is one of the engineers. All the other engineers are in the back with all the equipment, which you can kind of see in the upper right-hand corner. So um, one day, they, uh, the driver uh, gets out and goes in the back of the van, working with the other guys. A police car comes and sees this nondescript, unmarked van with a big stack dipole array antenna coming up the top. <laughs> See, nobody's in the cab, so he goes around to the back, and he knocks on the door, and they open up the door, and he sees all these computers and these geeky-looking guys. And, the, and uh, he's, the cop says, uh, who are you? And one guy says, oh, we work for the government. <laughs> says, Which government? <laughs> but officer, we were only going 50 kilobits a second. <laughs> so, I don't know, minus two. Bad. Actually, we were going 100 kilobits a second now that I think about it. Uh, the thing I also wanted to illustrate for you is this is somewhere, you know, around 19 probably 75, 76. We were already then beginning to experiment with packetized voice. We hadn't quite got to packet video, but we were getting there. But packet voice was important to us because in a military command and control system, we wanted voice, video, and data to be carried. We didn't want the traditional voice command and control network. Now, we, we actually didn't have a whole lot of bandwidth available to us. We were able to radiate in the packet radio net at 100 kilobits a second and 400 kilobits a second, but when it got into the ARPANET, it was uh, throttled down to 50 kilobits per second because that was the backbone speed available in the, at that time. So a normal, video, um, normal uh, audio uh, channel is 64 kilobits a second you know, with uh, 8,000 si samples per second at 8 bits each. So uh, you can't get a lot of 64 kilobit channels in a 50 kilobit pipe. So we had to stop this stuff down to about 1,800 bits a second. And the way we did that was to use a linear predictive code model of the voice tract as a stack of cylinders that are changing their diameter as you speak, and that stack is excited by a formant frequency. You take that model and you uh, generate 1,800 bits a second of data going to the other side, which inverts the uh, operation and produces sound. And that actually works. There was one little side effect, though, because, you know, you lose a certain amount of quality when you go from 64 kilobits down to 1,800. Anybody that spoke through the system sounded like a drunken Norwegian. <laughs> and uh, so the day came, by this time, I'm in the Defense Department, I'm in Washington, and I have to demonstrate this system to a bunch of generals. And I remember thinking, okay, how am I going to do this? <laughs> and then I remembered that one of the participants in the packet voice program was Ingvar Lund from the Norwegian Defense Research Establishment. <laughs> So we had Ingvar speak through the ordinary telephone system, Autobahn, and then we had him speak through our network, and it sounded exactly the same. <laughs> what we didn't tell the generals is everybody would sound that way. <laughs> 
<laughs> so packet radio worked incredibly well. After we you know, built the Bay Area system, we then replicated it at Fort Bragg in North Carolina and did military exercises to demonstrate the utility of radio-based packet switching going through uh, a gateway into the ARPANET and then reaching computing assets at USC Information Sciences Institute to perform uh, various kinds of logistics functions for, in this case, the 18th Airborne Corps. Uh, as far as packet satellite goes, uh, we put ground stations at ETAM, West Virginia, and in uh, e uh, Norway. Uh, actually, it was in Tonham, Sweden, with a link up to uh, the Norwegian Defense Research Establishment and a dedicated circuit from Norway to um, University College London. The packet satellite net actually had multiple ground stations, not just two. We had them uh, in the US, we had them in the UK, we had them in uh, Norway, we had them in uh, Germany and Italy. It was like a uh, sort of an ethernet in the sky. And so the um, way in which this uh, allocation was done is that everybody, we, we, would, we would break the satellite transmissions up into two periods of time. One was contention mode to announce how much capacity you needed. And everybody was supposed to hear these requests and then after that contention announcement of what you needed, then everybody calculated the optimum schedule. And everybody then, since everybody was supposed to calculate the same thing, everybody should calculate the same schedule if they heard the same thing. And then everybody transmitted at the appropriate time. So that was the scheduled period uh, as opposed to the contention period for announcing requirement. Um, this, um, this is called priority-oriented demand allocation algorithm or something like that. Of course, if you didn't hear something because of a um, collision and nobody heard it, that was okay. And, and in particular, you didn't hear your scheduling. You didn't hear your own request, so you knew that you hadn't been scheduled. Sometimes you'd get out of sync. And if you transmitted when somebody else did, you would detect that as a collision. Then you would shut up and listen until you got back in sync again. This also worked very well. And on November 22nd, 1977, we performed the first three network experiment with the ARPANET, the packet radio net, and the packet satellite net. The van is running up and down the Bayshore Freeway, radiating packets through a gateway that went into the ARPANET that went all the way across the ocean through an internal satellite link to Norway and then down to University College London, which went out through another gateway. We didn't know they were supposed to be called routers, so we call them gateways. Uh, and uh, into the packet satellite net, all the way up and down the packet satellite net to ETAM, West Virginia, back through another gateway, all the way across the ARPANET to USC Information Sciences Institute. Well, San, San Francisco to LA is 400 miles, but the packet actually traveled 100,000 miles. It was going up and down twice on satellite links, synchronous satellite links, plus back and forth across the, uh, the ocean. So um, the packets actually made it, in spite of the fact that they're a long journey. And of course, we were leaping up and down saying, it works, it works, as if it couldn't possibly have worked. It's software, right? It's a miracle whenever, whenever software works. <laughs> so that was, the, that was really an important milestone. And I think that's 1977, so quite a long time ago. Now, if you fast forward to 1999, the internet looks like that. Um, and this is an important picture for the following reason. The colors are different autonomous systems. The network is made up of somewhere between 400 and 500,000 autonomous systems. They are all independently operated. They have different business models. Some are for-profit, some are not-for-profit, some are government, some are private sector. Uh, every one of the operators makes his or her own decision about what equipment to buy, what versions of software to run, who to interconnect with. I mean, it's all you know, bilateral negotiations. There is no uh, regulatory restriction on who connects to whom. The system is entirely loosely coupled. And it is that loose coupling which has allowed the net to continue to expand. Bob and I had the theory that if we released the design of the internet publicly, which we did, no patents or anything, that anyone who wanted to build a piece of it could do that and then try to find somebody to connect up to. And our theory was the network would grow organically, and that's exactly what's happened. Uh, so that's 1999. If you fast forward to the present, the internet looks like that. Uh, it's just more connected uh, and more in, uh, in more places all around the world. Speaking of which, uh, here's where the users are, and or at least how many there are. There are about 2.4 billion people who believe to be using the internet today, and this doesn't necessarily count some number of people whose only access to the net is mobile. That might add another half a billion or so. Now there are six and a half billion mobiles in use. The slide's slightly out of date. 
Uh, six and a half billion mobiles, but a lot of those uh, six billion are used by people who are already on the internet using other equipment or they already have laptops and desktops. So um, uh, maybe a half a billion of them are, are dependent solely on uh, mobiles for access to the net. Uh, as to the number of devices on the net, there are uh, estimated to be a little over 900 million devices that have dedicated IP addresses and have domain names that are fixed. So these are the servers on the net. That's not how many devices there are on the net. That's just how many things are on the net with dedicated IP addresses and domain names. There are devices that are hiding behind uh, load sharing systems like at Google. So you don't actually see the total number of machines that we have on the net because they're not directly visible. They're hiding behind load sharing systems. And of course, a lot of uh, enterprise systems are hiding behind firewalls. You don't see those hosts directly either. Uh, and, so, and then there, there are things that are episodically connected, like laptops and uh, pads and things of that sort, as well as mobiles. So the actual number of internet-enabled devices might exceed two or three billion at this point. Uh, nobody knows because you don't have to register them all in any one place. Now, as to where the users are, this is actually a significant chart for a number of different reasons. If you were interested in going into business and you wanted to have a sense for where is my market, and what does that market look like? You'd be looking at charts like this. There are a billion users in Asia. Half of them are in mainland China. Now, in spite of the fact that there are a lot of issues associated with the Chinese treatment of the internet, its uh, interference with our products and others, uh, its uh, injection of jitter and its uh, black holing of YouTube and things like that, the, uh, China is still investing heavily in the internet. They are using it heavily in the country. So uh, there, it's sort of a, a conundrum in a sense, but uh, we can't ignore that. Uh, then the rest of the, of the uh, another half billion are made up of people in India, people in Indonesia, and other high population uh, countries in that area, Japan, for example, and Malaysia, and so forth. I've given up on uh, estimating anything about Europe. There are a half billion users now, but they keep adding countries, so the definition of Europe keeps changing, so I don't <laughs> make any predictions about that. And the rest of the uh, uh, allocations are as you see. The reason I put this up in part, though, is to remind you from a global business point of view that this chart tells you about the uh, kinds of culture, language, styles, expectations, and everything else around the world that are known to be or expect, uh, estimated to be online on the internet. So it tells you something about the size of markets <coughs> and their dynamic variation that you need to understand in order to, be, uh, to meet that market. Some of the things that are going on today. Uh, well, uh, IP version 6 was introduced formally uh, around the world on June 6th of this year. We ran a test for a day, 24-hour test, in uh, around June 8th of 2011. Now the question is, what's IPv6 and why do we have to implement it? My guess is you all have been introduced to IPv6 by now, yes? So that means you were all introduced to the fact that IPv4 only had a 32-bit address space. That number was chosen in 1973. This is when the internet was still an experiment. And Bob and I didn't know whether it was going to work. We hoped it would, but we weren't sure because we hadn't even implemented it yet. That was just a design. And I remember we asked ourselves, OK, uh, how many networks should we uh, provide for? And we said, well, let's see. Uh, how many countries are there in the world? And you know we didn't know, and there wasn't any Google to ask. So uh, so we we guessed, and since you're, we're software people, you know we picked a, a number that was a power of two. So we thought, okay, there's 128 countries. How many networks will they have? Well, we just finished building the internet, and it was not cheap. So we thought, well, maybe there'd only be two per country, uh, or at least you know national scale networks. So okay, so that's eight bits. And then what about hosts? Well, in those days. Uh, we were heavily dependent on time sharing. And a time shared machine was a thing that took up a room or two and it was air conditioned and it sure as hell didn't get up and wander around and it didn't fit in your pocket. So we assumed that 16 million of these would be more than enough for any one country. So that's another 24 bits. So that's 32 bits. It adds up to 4.3 billion terminations. And at the time, we both thought, surely this is enough to do an experiment. Um, in 1977, in 1977, there was actually a serious consideration about whether 
we should have a larger address space. And there were people who argued for 32, because that seemed rational. There were people who argued for variable length, because that would make it extensible. But the programmers hated that. They said, oh, no, we don't want variable length, because that messes up the packet format and means we'll waste extra computer cycles trying to find the rest of the fields in the packet. So that sucked. And so we said, OK, we won't do that. And then somebody said, what about 128 bits? And they said, but that's 3.4 times 10 to the 38th addresses. That's a number only the Congress can understand. <laughs> <laughs> and it honestly didn't pass the red face test. I mean, I could not imagine standing up in front of some you know, member of Congress ex describing this uh, work that we were doing, saying, and yes, uh, Senator, we, uh, we need to have 3.4 times 10 to the 38th addresses in order to do this experiment. You know, and his reaction would be something like, well, that's enough address space to, uh, for every electron in the universe to have a web page. <laughs> Except for one thing, web pages hadn't been invented yet, and there's actually 10 to the 88th electrons in the universe. It'd be off by 50 orders of magnitude. <laughs> anyway, we didn't do 128. Then we ran out in April of 2011. And by running out, I mean simply that the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, which assigns address space to the regional internet registries, of which there are five, who then turn uh, address, uh, assign address space to the ISPs, uh, ICANN officially ran out of its V4 address space in April 2011. Shortly thereafter, the AP NIC Regional Internet Registry ran out of its allocation. Then, just recently this year, uh, the RIPE NCC guys ran out. AP uh, AFRINIC, and LACNIC, and ARIN here in the US uh, are still, uh, still have some of their V4 address allocations available. But that's when it became apparent that we needed a V6. Actually, we were terrified that we were going to run out around 1992. So we all went into high, high gear to develop IPv6. Now, some of you who are counting should wonder, what happened to IPv5? Anybody here know what happened to IPv5? Yes, yes. So the, uh, the field in the header, uh, the versioning field, 5 was already used for something else. I think it had to do with stream video. Well, yeah, that's exactly right. You guys, he get, does he get, do we get prizes here? <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a Google we'll pen to give you. <laughs> we, tried, we tried out streaming video with IP version 5, and it did not work out because it didn't scale. So we abandoned that, and the next obvious number was 6. And we argued for four years over what it should look like in the Internet Engineering Task Force and finally settled on IPv6. So I'm sorry, that's a long story to get to the point where uh, uh, to explain why we screwed up and picked 32 bits instead of 128. The other thing which has been, another thing which has been going on is that uh, even though the original design, both of the ARPANET and then the Internet, used ASCII as a way of representing domain names, it became very apparent uh, after uh, the Internet was popularized through the World Wide Web that um, people who didn't happen to speak languages expressible in ASCII should have similar representation in the domain name system. So we spent several years working out a way to put uh, Unicode represented characters into the domain name system. We actually wound up having to do a kind of a hack where we would take the Unicode characters, map them into ASCII so that we didn't have to change any of the domain servers that we're only capable of, of, uh, of using ASCII characters. But those have been introduced now into uh, the network at all levels, including top-level domains. It hasn't been widely used, which was a little disappointing, because we thought we'd gone to a lot of work to put that stuff in there. And I can only imagine one of two things. The countries where these languages are, uh, are present uh, are somehow more comfortable or comfortable enough with ASCII, or we haven't yet hit those countries that really want to have uh, internationalized domain names and haven't asked to register them. I'll give you a few examples of the ones that have already been approved. The other thing that uh, happened is that ICANN had been under some pressure for quite some time to um, expand the number of generic top-level domains. When the system was first started, the domain name system was designed in 84, we only had seven top-level domains of the generic type, comnet, org, mil, gov, int, and so on. Uh, over the course of uh, the 14 years of ICANN's existence, we added another 14 or so. Things that you probably never see, like dot .travel, dot .coop, and dot .arrow, and dot .name, and so on. But under uh, a certain amount of pressure from an, an oversight organization that has a contract with ICANN that enables it to operate, this is the National Telecommunications Inform Information Agency, part of the Department of Commerce, that organization uh, pressed for new TLDs to promote competition. So ICANN opened up an opportunity for anyone who wanted to 
to submit a proposal. There were 2,000 proposals coming in, some of them overlapping, uh, that colliding with each other. Um, but they were charged $185,000 per application. So when the day arrived to turn in your application and pay your money, $350 million flowed into the ICANN uh, bank, which is pretty impressive considering when I was around at the beginning of the organization, I had a little tin cup and I was lucky to get a million and a half dollars to keep the organization afloat. Another thing which is, uh, we have not, we've not yet turned on any of those new GTLDs. Those will come sometime in uh, mid, probably mid-year 2013. There's another problem, and that's the domain name system's proclivity to be hijacked. And the resolvers, for example, that are caching when you do a lookup, <coughs> and the resolver figures out what the IP address is that matches <coughs> the domain name, will cache that information so it doesn't have to look it up again. <coughs> Sorry. Ah. Um, and what can happen is that if somebody breaks into the resolver, and adds things into the table, the cache, that uh, direct people to the wrong IP address, all kinds of bad things can happen. Like they direct you to something that looks like Bank of America, they screen scrape the images, and you land on that site, and it asks for your username and password, which you give it, it proceeds to empty your account while it <coughs> redirects you over to the real site, and you have no idea that's happened. The solution to that problem is to introduce what's called domain name system security extensions which allow you to store not only the domain name and the IP address that matches it, but to digitally sign that binding. And when the resolver says, please give me a signed answer to this lookup, it can get back the confirmation that the, re the response is actually digitally signed and matches, which means that the integrity has been maintained. The data that's in that uh, domain name entry hasn't been altered <coughs> by someone since the time it was actually put in. That's now propagating uh, through the domain name system. The root zone <coughs> was signed uh, a couple of years ago now, and many of the top-level domains are now signing, and the secondary domains are being signed as well. It's also possible to hijack the uh, address space by simply announcing address space that doesn't belong to you. And uh, the problem here is that everybody who's running the global routing protocols, the border gateway protocol, uh, relied on trusting people not to cheat. And some people do. So the solution to that problem, which hasn't been implemented yet, is to have the regional internet registries maintain a table. And every time an autonomous system has been assigned new IP address space, an entry is made in the table saying, this autonomous system has this address space, digitally sign the pair. That means when you receive a, an update or an announcement of, uh, that you are responsible for this piece of the IP address space, so please route packets going to that part of the address space to them, you can verify that the, the announcing autonomous system actually has the authority to do that. That's not yet been implemented, but it's being, uh, it is in the process of being implemented. The other three things that are um, relevant to current activity are that sensor networks are becoming part of the Internet's environment. Smart, uh, the Smart Grid program started by the Department of Energy and the Department of Commerce um, is using IP version 6 and some other additional protocols on top of that to enable smart programmable electric electricity consuming devices not only to report their use of electricity so that you and I can figure out you know why is my electrical bill that much this month you know which devices consumed it and when what could I do to reduce my electric electrical uh, consumption, electricity consumption. One answer might be don't heat the water during a peak load or don't run the air conditioners when, you, when it's at a peak uh, demand. And the devices can also respond to advice saying I'm about to enter into peak load mode. If you keep running the electricity, it will cost you more. Maybe you don't want to run uh, the air conditioner for a while. That's going on now. And finally, mobile devices are all over the place. Here's a few examples of domain names uh, that are written in um, um, Unicode, uh, that's, if it's an eye chart, don't worry about it. The point I just want to make is that those, these character sets are now available. This one is actually a little more interesting. You'll notice that uh, we've got the actual internationalized domain name shown here, except for this one. Uh, and that's showing these little squares because when I made the slide, my uh, Mac didn't have uh, the Sinhala character set available in it. And I don't know why. I mean, I know it's a stupid oversight on my part. 
But we're going to see things like this from time to time uh, when you're actually looking at internationalized domain names. If your laptop, desktop, mobile, or what have you, doesn't happen to have the uh, appropriate uh, character set to represent the uh, Unicode characters. Now, I'd be remiss if I didn't say we have security problems in the net. And uh, this is, I'm not going to go down, down through every single bullet point here. The thing I want to point out is that some of the problems are a consequence of uh, technical attacks. And I'll give a list of the examples of vulnerabilities, why those attacks sometimes uh, occur or why they sometimes succeed. But some of the problems are, are of our own doing. We do this to ourselves. We use bad passwords, guessable passwords, dictionary attack passwords. And some people use password for their password because it's easy to remember. This is not a good excuse for, because other people know this too. And so accounts get hijacked as a result. There's social engineering where somebody calls up at 3 o'clock in the morning and says, ah, the system's falling apart and I'm the responsible engineer and I forgot the password to get into, your controls, in, into our control system. Uh, can you please tell me so I don't get fired? And if it's 3 in the morning and the network engineer is kind of panicked a little bit, might give away a piece of information. And the guy on the other end sounds credible because he's you know, seen some email and he knows some people's names to say, so he sounds like he's actually legitimate. This goes on a lot of the time. That's social engineering. So there's, but the thing at the bottom is the one that causes the most, most problem on the internet is just stupid mistakes. Uh, an example of this is in, uh, in Pakistan, um, the ISP was told by the Pakistani government to block YouTube. So they started announcing an address which was, uh, you know, more complete than the address that we would normally announce for the YouTube address space. And of course that meant everybody that was going in that direction uh, followed that particular path towards Pakistan which went into a black hole. But the announcement escaped from the geographical territory of Pakistan so half the internet was routing traffic to this black hole. And we noticed that pretty quickly. <coughs> and we said, what the hell are you doing? And they said, oh, oh, sorry, it was a mistake. You know, we didn't do that right. And I actually believe them. I mean, I think this is a typical example of a, a mistake. So if anybody's here from Pakistan, I'm not trying to badmouth any of the engineers there. Everybody makes these kinds of mistakes. And they are usually the most damaging ones because they're inadvertent. And if you want a really hard dissertation topic, go figure out how to detect that a particular configuration is wrong. It's easy to tell if an, el an element of a configuration is out of spec, you know, it's out of, out of the right range. But it's often very hard to figure out that this combination of configurations leads to trouble. It's a very tough problem and uh, uh, nobody has a good solution to it as far as I know. There's a list of a bunch of um, reasons why we have a lot of these troubles. We have crappy outframing systems that are vulnerable. They can be attacked. You want another dissertation topic, design a secure routing, or I mean a secure operating system, you know, you know and uh, describe this in 25 words or less. Uh, <laughs> and there'll be a final exam on Friday. Uh, how about browsers? Uh, what we need is browsers that are paranoid. Uh, what happens is that some browsers, well you understand how they work, right? They go to a website and they download a file, which is the home page, and then they interpret it. And back when Tim Berners-Lee was doing the uh, World Wide Web uh, around 1991 or so, the HTML that would be downloaded was pretty innocuous, right? It was text, formatting information, and sometimes it was imagery. But today when you download one of these home pages, it has Java or JavaScript or Python or some other high-level language in it, and the browser interprets those codes in addition to doing formatting and everything else. And some of the software can cause it to go store some uh, code in the middle of the operating system. Now, it, typically, if the browser gets away with that, it means it's been given too much privilege by the operating system in the first place. What you need is sandboxing mechanisms to isolate the actions of the browser from the rest of the operating system. So we need to make paranoid browsers, and we need to make more resistant operating systems. And there's a bunch of other issues here. The bad thing is that once uh, these computers are compromised, they become parts of botnets, and they're, which are controllable by third parties. And those botnets are used to launch denial of service attacks or launch to generate spam or do all, all kinds of other bad things. And some of that is not done just by hackers, but it's being done by organized crime. And in some cases, it's being done by state-sponsored entities, and that's called cyber warfare. Now, uh, given that I've already rattled on for 40 minutes here, uh, let me try to pick a, a very um, specific part of this slide. 
I want you to, this is another really tough problem. And it would deserve your attention if you're looking for a serious contribution. Every time you use a complex piece of code, like a spreadsheet or a text document or uh, some other, uh, maybe a presentation uh, application program, you create a complex file full of bits. The bits are meaningless unless the application is available to interpret them. The question is, for how long will that application be available to interpret the bits? Now, I'm actually not too worried about the ability to preserve the bits themselves. The media will come and go. I mean, there are not too many machines have the five and a quarter inch floppies, which some of you probably never seen except in a history book, or a three and a half inch disc, or, or even a CD or DVD. My, my Macintosh doesn't have a DVD reader in it anymore um, because they ran out of room. I guess they were squishing it. So oh, you can carry a dongle with an attachment that makes your briefcase weigh even more. Um, the point here is that we can preserve the bits, but can we preserve their meaning? And it's not as simple as you might think. For one, th it's to give you a simple scenario, suppose that you're using a product to generate, let's say, um, you know, text documents and images and presentations, and you've invested a lot in generating that content. And then one day, the company that makes that software says, we're not going to support that version anymore. Here's the new version. It only runs on this new operating system. So now you feel forced to go get a new operating system. And then they say, oh, sorry, we made enough changes in this because we're adding features that it doesn't know how to read the old stuff. And oh, we didn't bother making a translation program to get from the old format to the new one. Too bad. And then you say, well, you know, can I have the source code so I can, you know, fix this? And they'll say, no, it's our source code and we paid for it and you can't have it, you know, go away. There are a bunch of other scenarios that involve intellectual property treatment for people who want to control their software. Or you get stuck because you don't have um, a version of the software that will run on the latest operating system. Even if you had a copy of the software and it was running okay before, maybe it won't run on the new version of the operating system. The worst case scenario is one where you have an application that used to work on a specific operating system version that also depended on a particular hardware base, and none of them are available anymore. So what do you do? Well, you say, well, maybe cloud computing will solve my problem. What do you mean? Well, how about if I emulate the hardware, and then I run the operating system that used to work on that real hardware, and then I run the application that used to work on that operating system. And so now I have the application that runs on the operating system that ran on the hardware that produced the um, the, the object that you're trying to interpret. So it's barely conceivable that the, the cloud system might allow us to preserve the functionality of applications beyond uh, the point where they normally would run on hardware. Uh, I wanted to show you, oh, so this problem of the bits not being interpreted anymore I call bit rot. And I actually had an, an example of this happen to me. I, my figurative thing is it's year 3000 and I do a Google search and I turn up a 1997 PowerPoint file, and I'm running Windows 3000. So uh, the question is, does it know how to interpret you know, this 1990,000-year-old PowerPoint file? The answer is probably no. I already had this experience in 2012, running the 2010 Microsoft PowerPoint, trying to read a 1997 PowerPoint file, and the 2010 version said, what's this? <laughs> uh, so, you know, it's PowerPoint, you little bull. So. <laughs> And I'm not, I'm really not poking, I am poking fun at Microsoft, but I don't, <laughs> you know, I admit, I admit that. But this is not unique to them. This is a problem everyone could potentially have, even if it was open source. Imagine trying to maintain open source for a thousand years. Uh, so this is a serious problem. And we, if we don't solve it, then people in the, you know, the 22nd century will wonder about us because all that they could know about us are tied up in bits that are no longer interpretable, and that's the bit rot problem. This picture, by the way, is uh, something called the Feistos disk. It's a, I don't know how big it is, you know, something like this. Uh, it, it comes from um, Crete, and nobody knows what it means. It's readable. You can see it. You can see the symbols, but we don't know what they mean. This is the problem. This is the bit rot problem that we're going to have. We can maintain the bits. They're still readable but we don't know what they mean. So this is a serious problem and we have to solve it. Um, oh, I'm really worried about time here, so let me 
let me compress things. Um, I do want to emphasize once again that we have an avalanche of devices that are going to come on the net. Sometimes this is called the Internet of Things. And I certainly didn't imagine that there would be refrigerators on the Internet when we were first doing the design. Now there are. Or picture frames. Somebody ran into my office saying, Ben, did you see this Internet-enabled picture frame? And my first thought was, boy, that sounds like as useful as an electric fork. You know, uh, so, <laughs> so, so, <laughs> it turns out it's actually very useful because, you know, you upload your pictures and you know, the grandparents can see what the grandchildren are doing. Unless somebody hacks the website, in which case the grandparents hope that's not pictures of the grandchildren. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, there's a guy in the Netherlands that invented an Internet-enabled surfboard. I I haven't met him, but I think he's sitting on the water waiting for the next wave, thinking, you know, if I had a laptop on my surfboard, I, I could be surfing the internet while I'm waiting. To <laughs> so, so he built the laptop and the surfboard, and he puts the, you know, Wi-Fi service in the radio in the rescue shack. I used to tell jokes like, someday every light bulb in the world will have an internet address. I can't tell jokes about it. Somebody sent me an IPv6 enabled light bulb, you know, with, with, with a little radio in it, so you can, you know, remotely control the thing. So that's coming. This stuff is real. Here's another example of that. Sensor nets. This is a commercial product. It was made by a company called Artrock, um, which was acquired by Cisco Systems not you know, a year or so ago. So I have a bunch of uh, little uh, three volt sensors in every room in the house that are detecting temperature, humidity, and light levels every five minutes, and they report that through a mesh network to uh, a server down in the basement. I know only a geek would do this, but at the end of the year, I have very good information about the heating, ventilation, and air conditioning and how well it performs, so when it comes time to adjust the thing, I've got engineering measurements as opposed to anecdotal stories. One room uh, in, the, uh, in the house is a wine cellar, and it's important to keep that below 60 degrees Fahrenheit. So uh, if that happens to break, if we break through that temperature barrier, then I get an SMS on my mobile saying that, you know, your wine is warming up. And that's happened a couple of times where the power has gone out, the temperature has gone up, and I get reports every five minutes say your wine is warming up. <laughs> Eventually I called and said, uh, you know, do you, do you make a remote uh, actuator so I can reset the, uh, the cooling system? And they said yes, and I said, do you have strong authentication on it? Because there was a 15-year-old next door, and I don't want him messing around with my wine cellar. <laughs> <laughs> so that was easy to put in. Then I got to thinking, gee, I can tell if somebody went in the wine cellar when I'm not there, because I see the lights go off and on, but I don't know what they did in there. So um, I thought, well, why don't I put an RFID chip on each bottle? And, and then I can do an instantaneous uh, you know, um, inventory of the wine to see if any wine has left the wine cellar without my permission. I was describing this design to one of my engineering friends who said, there's a bug. And he said, what do you mean there's a bug? And he said, well, you could go into the wine cellar and drink the wine and leave the bug. <laughs> <laughs> That's a bug. So, so now we've got to put sensors in the cork. And so before you, before you uh, open the bottle, you interrogate the cork, and if that's the one that got to 90 degrees, that's the bottle to give to somebody who doesn't know the difference. <laughs> so here's what I'd like to do. I have lots of other stuff and not enough time, so I'm going to switch over here to give you a fast update on where we are with the interplanetary internet. This, uh, some people, when I started talking about this in late 97, uh, everybody thought, e boop, I'd gone over the top. <laughs> But in fact, uh, this was a problem that my colleagues and I at the Jet Propulsion Lab had encountered because we started reflecting on what we had been doing to uh, explore Mars. Now, since the 1960s, spacecraft had been going to Mars. The uh, American uh, Viking uh, spacecraft landed, a pair of them landed in 1976. Then in 1997, the Pathfinder uh, little rover landed. Then came the 2004 rovers that landed in January and lasted for seven years, uh, and then came the Mars Science Lander and the Phoenix Lander. So every one of those was controlled by, uh, at least was planned to be controlled by a direct radio link from Earth to Mars. And the, we got to thinking around 1998, well, what if we had a better, richer networking environment so we could support much more complex spacecraft uh, configurations where multiple rovers were on the surface, we had sensor networks, we had multiple orbiters, all of them able to locally communicate instead of having to go back and forth between Earth and Mars. So we started thinking, well, mm, maybe we could use um, TCP IP. It works on Earth. It ought to work on Mars. <laughs> and it does work on Mars, but it doesn't work between the planets. One of the problems is the speed of light is too slow. 
And the distance between Mar Earth and Mars ranges from 35 million to 235 million miles, which is three and a half minutes to 20 minutes one way, and it's double that round trip. TCP IP flow control doesn't do well with a 40 minute round trip time. <laughs> So, uh, oh, there's another problem. It's called celestial motion. The planets are rotating. We don't know how to stop that yet. So, <laughs> so you're talking to something on the surface and the planet rotates and you can't talk to it until it comes back around again. <laughs> so you have a, del a variably delayed and disrupted environment in space. So we needed to overcome that. So we developed a set of protocols that we call delay and disruption tolerant networking protocols or bundle protocol for short. And those protocols are now, uh, their prototypes anyway, are being used in the Mars environment. Uh, when the uh, rovers first landed uh, over here, uh, Opportunity and, uh, what was the other one? Spirit, Spirit and Opportunity. When they landed, the original plan was for them to transmit data directly back to Earth with a radio that was running at 28 kilobits a second. The scientists were not happy about 28 kilobits a second. They had a lot of data, they wanted to get it back, but that's all we could do. So um, we turned the radios on and they overheated. And so, you know, the first reaction is, holy crap, and let's uh, reduce the duty cycle so we don't lose um, uh, the, you know, the, uh, any of the other equipment. <coughs> at that point, the scientists are now really unhappy, but the guys at the Jet Propulsion Lab said, well, you know, we have an X-band radio on the rover that, uh, and we have an X-band radio on the orbiters, which were already there because they'd been used to map the surface of Mars to figure out where the rovers should be landed. So the end result was they said, well, why don't we reprogram the rovers and the orbiters so the uh, rovers could squirt data up to the orbiter and the orbiter would hang onto the data till it got to the right place in its orbit and it would transmit that data back to Earth. And because the orbiters were outside of the atmosphere and had bigger solar panels, they could transmit data at 128 kilobits a second. The X-band radio couldn't get all the way back to Earth, but it could get up to the rover, it, uh, to the orbiter, at 128 kilobits a second. So instead of 28 kilobits a second, we could transmit data four times faster. That's now been either doubled or quadrupled uh, since then with various coding methods. All the data that's coming back from Mars is going store and forward, which is, of course, the way packet switching works, the way the internet works. Uh, so our, uh, the conclusion we reached was that we should really develop a set of protocols that would support that mode. The prototypes went into the Phoenix lander because it landed at the North Pole and there was no configuration that would allow it to go directly back to Earth. So we used the same prototype protocols to do store and forward. The Mars Science Laboratory, same story, using the prototypes of the delay and disruption tolerant networking. There's an epoxy spacecraft, the one in the up, upper uh, middle there. It used to be called uh, Deep Impact, and it was used to uh, rendezvous with a comet and launch a probe into it, blow it out, and then do a, uh, an analysis of the interior so we could see what kinds of materials made up this primordial uh, um, uh, comet. So uh, later it rendezvoused with another comet called Hartley 2, which is why it's now called the epoxy spacecraft. All of these have had the um, prototype uh, software on board. And let me skip over to here. So now what's going on is that we are standardizing the bundle protocols in the Consultative Committee on Space Data Systems. That committee is made up of all the spacefaring nations of the world. And if they adopt the protocols, what we anticipate will happen is it will launch <coughs> new missions uh, with these protocols on board. And once the missions have been Excuse me, once the scientific missions have been completed, the spacecraft can be repurposed to be, just as we did the uh, orbiters around Mars, to become part of an interplanetary backbone. So we can grow this backbone over time as we launch new missions. So we're not trying to build a big interplanetary backbone and hope somebody will come. What we're doing is building it up as missions demand it. It will be suitable for supporting uh, both manned and robotic spacecraft. And that's not the end of the story. Um, ARPA, which did, did the funding of ARPANET, the funding of Internet, the funding of the original interplanetary backbone uh, architecture, has uh, now assigned a uh, study uh, task to a consortium that I'm fortunate to participate in to design a spacecraft to get to the nearest star in 100 years elapsed time. Now this is something of a trick because the nearest star is four light years away, 4.4, it's Andromeda. With the current propulsion systems, it would take 65,000 years to get there. That's a little long even for an ARPA project. 
<laughs> so uh, the current the prob first problem is, uh, what kind of propulsion can I use to get to the nearest star in 100 years? Right now, the proposition is probably a form of ion engine with a substantial amount of thrust. The second problem is navigation. Um, you know, it, it, the stars aren't where we think they are because you know, the information we receive about their position is delayed by the speed of light. So when the spacecraft gets about a light year away, it may be time to do some mid-course correction. The problem is if you try to tell it anything, it takes a, a year for the signal to get there, and then it takes a year, for the, or maybe even two years, for the signal to get back. So um, there's a little problem trying to do remote control navigation. Fortunately, we have enough information about the proper motion of the stars within about 10 light years that we can, in fact, do autonomous navigation by using stars that are even farther away whose positions don't change very much even if we move four light years away. So that's the likely way we'll do this is autonomously navigate. Uh, then there's signaling. How do I generate a signal that can be detected from four light years away? And one possibility is to use a femtosecond laser which could take 100 watts uh, power source, squeeze it down to 10 to the minus 15 seconds, which gives you a very big pulse, and transmit that back to Earth. And you might be able to detect that, although by the time it gets four light years away, its beam has spread to about the size of the solar system, so now you know why I need the interplanetary backbone to build a you know, um, synthetic aperture receiver to integrate the light signal coming from four light years away. However, <laughs> One of the guys in the, in the uh, study group said, uh, wait a minute, you remember <coughs> Einstein's theory? Yes. And he said, do you remember how they showed that it was true? No. Well, back around 1916 or something, the, there was an eclipse of the sun, and there was a star, which was very close to the sun, that moved closer. It looked like it moved closer because the light was bent by gravity. We just couldn't see it until we had an eclipse, which was, you know, the prediction was uh, calculated by Einstein's theory, and it said that light would bend in a gravity field. Well, that's cool. It turns, if you do the math, it turns out that if you go 550 astronomical units away from the sun, you're right there in the focal plane of the gravitational field of the sun. So if we could put a spacecraft at the right place between 550 and 1,000 AU out, we can use the sun to, build the focal, uh, to focus the signal coming from Alpha Centauri. So now I don't have to build a synthetic aperture receiver. I just have to get a spacecraft 550 AU away from the sun. That's not, I that mean, we'd never been out that far. Even the um, uh, uh, Voyagers, yeah, the Voyager spacecraft has just left the solar system, and that's only 13 billion miles away. So uh, we have a lot of work to do to make all this thing hang together. I can tell you that um, even though even though I won't be around to actually see this thing happen, when you're sitting around talking about things like, let's see, how long does it take to send, transmit that signal? What power levels will it be? How much uh, dissipation will there be? Do I have a detector that's good enough? A low noise receiver, blah, blah, blah. It's like living in a science fiction story, and it's a lot of fun, but it also underscores something about engineering, which is, is engineering turns science fiction into reality. That's what we get to do, and that's what you're going to get to do, too. I'll stop there. I'm happy to answer questions, and uh, we'll just go from there. But thanks for letting me come here tonight. <laughs> now, before you ask any questions, I have to replace a battery. Otherwise, I'll just freeze like that. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm, uh, I will... I realize I went on a little longer than I should have. That's what happens, you get an old Stanford professor and, trap, you know, and you're trapped in the room. So I'll repeat any questions if, if need be. Any questions? I won't be insulted if you don't have any, yeah. it's okay. There's one yeah, in the back. Yeah, question over here. Do you think it's... Wait a minute, difficult? wait a minute, I'm gonna, I'm gonna oh, try. Yeah, yeah. Okay, <laughs> no, no, I'm gonna try no, the lip read, you know, this may not work. <laughs> <laughs> and then if it doesn't make any sense, it'll be his fault. Yeah. <laughs> so about the pit rot, yeah. do you think it's feasible to try and have um, software people enforce some kind of like simplified standard? Like they can make files more and more complex, but yeah. they'll always have some like .txt or whatever that it will maintain across the world. Okay, so the, the question, since probably maybe not all of you heard it, is is it possible to enforce some kind of a simplified standard so that all the complex objects that get created could at least be persistently represented. The answer is you could do that for some of the cases. 
That's what uh, the guys at Adobe have done with their, what they call PDFA, which is the archive format for uh, the print definition format or whatever that acronym stands for. The problem is that there are complex objects that don't necessarily fall into that space. You know, uh, programs that are used for video games and things like that probably have very unique kinds of data structures. So uh, the answer is that there will be a variety of attacks. Yours is one of them. Others might involve escrow of the source software. So if the company goes out of business, the deal is you have to have the source code escrowed so that it's available to somebody in order to reconstruct uh, the application. I can imagine having big arm wrestling matches with the intellectual property community about patents and access to thing, source code. But an argument could be made that for preservation purposes, there should be a kind of a carve out of the normal protection features. So if the company goes out of business or refuses to continue to support the application, that there's some leverage that you have on the basis of archival requirement. Now, some people um, have been in conversations like this and uh, one uh, had a collection of librarians talking about the bit rot problem. They're very concerned about it because they are in the business of preservation of information and cataloging and, uh, and uh, curating uh, archival information. And one uh, young fellow got up and said, oh, this isn't a problem. I mean, the, the stuff that's important will get rewritten in new formats and the stuff that isn't important won't, it won't matter because nobody will care. It took half an hour to get the librarians off the ceiling. <laughs> they pointed out, I think properly so, that sometimes you don't know if a piece of information is important from the historical point of view for 100 or 200 years. And a really good example of this is a book called A Team of Rivals, which is about Abraham Lincoln bringing his opponents from the election into his cabinet. The lady who wrote that book managed to collect the letters that were exchanged by contemporaries of the time and reconstruct the conversations that would have been normal and common uh, during that time frame and all of the, you know, the Sturm und Drang and the emotion about whether, you know, people were willing to serve in the cabinet after having uh, competed with President Lincoln and everything else. She reconstructed history from those letters. And that's an example of the value of information that you might not realize was significant at the time. Okay, next question. Over here, and then I'll get this one here. Yep. <laughs> so, as you know, you're an engineer. A lot of us are engineers. Um, well, I, I pretend. That's why I wear a three-piece suit to hide the fact that I used to be an engineer. But anyway. <laughs> You've obviously been part of something that has been built up to affect a vast, vast number of people. And not every engineer, obviously, has the chance to affect so many people. But a lot of us are trying to figure out how we shape the decisions you know, wh how we choose what to work on. Yeah. Would you say, given your position now, that, you know, viewing things through the framework of how many people we can affect is a valid way to guide the life of an engineer? So, uh, and honestly, the answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> and and I'll, let me, I mean, I'm quite serious about this. I think that if you start out with the goal of affecting a large number of people or doing some big thing, that you may not succeed, and that's the wrong metric. I was just trying to solve a particular problem, and we wanted to solve it, Bob and I, in the most general way possible. We wanted to design an architecture and a <coughs> system that would admit of other people's ideas. So if new communications protocols came along, you could sweep them in because the internet packets don't know anything about how they're carried. We wanted to let people invent new applications that would interpret the bits of the packets however they wanted. So we made sure the internet protocol layer didn't know anything about what the, the bits mean. Uh, we didn't say anything about routing in the internet protocol spec, so we could have different routing protocols and we wouldn't have to change the packets. There were a whole bunch of decisions like that. Those decisions weren't made with the intent of affecting a large number of people, but they were made with the intent of allowing a large number of people to contribute their ideas. And in, it, we, I think we succeeded pretty well with that. But I would urge you not to use that is a metric. What you should do is find interesting problems that uh, really excite you and make them go. Make those work. I, mean, I can tell you that, that we, uh, when we worked on the interplanetary stuff, we were just trying to solve a specific set of, of problems and we wanted to do it to the best of our ability. But that's what turns me on, is just making stuff work. That's what makes engineering so much fun. The fact that it happens to have had a huge impact is in some sense a matter of um, uh, coincidence or happenstance. The circumstances were good. We fought battle after battle after battle. This didn't just happen. 
We fought X-25, we fought OSI, the Open Systems Interconnection Protocols, we fought Frame Relay, we fought ATM. Everyone said all those would replace TCP IP. And the answer, because of the way this had been designed, is that IP runs over everything, including you, if you're not paying attention. <laughs> and it, and that's, you know, that's why it worked, it's because we designed it that way. But we didn't anticipate that there would be you know, two or three billion people in the world using this stuff. We just wanted to make it work the best we could. And I would urge you to just focus on making stuff work and do stuff that you're really excited about. If you're not excited about it, don't do it. Do something else. Because the thing, it's the passion that makes the difference. If you want to have a big impact, you need to be prepared to sell your idea to anybody that comes along. So you can't just be an engineer, you have to be a salesman. And you have to get other people wanting to do what you want to do. That's how you have a big impact. Okay, there was a question here. So when you released the uh, TCP IP standards out to the world without any patents or any yeah. protection, was there any concern that somebody else would come along behind you and patent it? And patent it. Uh, so this is a question about patenting TCP IP. And there, first of all, it was deliberate. This, we actually <coughs> thought about this and we said we will not put any constraints on people's access to TCP IP. And here's the rationale. We knew that we wanted this non-proprietary protocol to be available to anyone, and in particular, we wanted the proprietary networking protocol companies, IBM, Digital, HP, to adopt this new standard, what we hoped would be an international standard. And we didn't want them to have the excuse that they had to pay a patent fee or something to use it, because they would say, we have our own networking capability, we don't need this non-proprietary stuff. So we wanted them not to have that argument. And we wanted anybody in the world to be able to use it, build uh, pieces of, of network <coughs> on top of it. The reason we weren't worried about somebody else coming along and patenting it at that time is that we had, could demonstrate prior art. It was well documented. We published the first paper in 1974 in IEEE Transactions on Communications before we'd actually implemented anything. Then we did the implementation starting in 1975. Uh, By the way, just uh, to, to tell you, uh, don't throw any of your papers away. Uh, a copy of the IEEE transactions on uh, communications from May of 74 was sold at auction for $35,000 last year. <laughs> now, I, of course, I went to my filing cabinet to see if I had any more. And I, and he had to, <laughs> I did, I did, by the way, I didn't sell it to somebody else. And I don't even think I had a copy left. I, you can find the paper on the net, so I figured, you know, who needs it? So uh, don't throw anything away. You never know when it might be valuable. Uh, so the other thing about uh, releasing TCP IP the way we did is that we were in the middle of the Cold War. And just think about this. We're being paid by the, by the U.S. Defense Department to do this work. Eventually, this is going to become the heart not only of the military communication system, but a major part of the global communication system. And we're handing it out to everybody, including the Russians and all the other you know, Cold War uh, adversaries. And, you know, you might say, well, how the hell did you get away with that? And, and the answer is, we didn't ask. <laughs> we just did it. And nobody noticed. Uh, and, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, this, this goes back to, um, uh, who's the, uh, the famous admiral? Who, um, oh, dear, I'm blocking on this. She was uh, very, f f we even do awards in her name. Grace Potter. Grace Potter, yes. Grace, so, Grace Hopper. Uh, I'm thinking Harry Potter. <laughs> Great. Duh. So Grace, uh, Grace Hopper um, had, had said frequently that you should, you should not ask for permission, but beg for forgiveness later. And nobody complained, so we didn't have to do that part. But sometimes taking initiative by just going and doing things is the right thing. Let's do one more, and then you probably all want to get out of here. This gentleman over here who's leaping out of his chair. Yes, sir? I have two questions. One. <laughs> the brief, she. The brief. You're a graduate student, right? <laughs> no, I'm actually a senior. Oh, uh, this is a classic behavior pattern. All right, go ahead. <laughs> well, my first is: so, do you do you program at all today, uh, just for fun? Or? Just, oh boy, you know, you wouldn't want to come anywhere close to one of my toxic programs. But uh, a little, a little Python now and then. But that's about all I ever have time for. And then, like, really, like, what does a day-to-day -day, uh, like? For the, chi for the chief internet evangelist? <laughs> well, so here's, well, I spend a lot of time doing stuff like this. 
because I really care about folks like you grabbing hold of the problems that haven't been solved for the internet yet. Like, how do we use broadcast radio? We do a terrible job with that, right? We turn it into point-to-point -point links with, you know, X, uh, with uh, Wi-Fi, and what we should be doing is developing protocols in the internet um, protocol structure to take advantage of a broadcast so we could deliver a million packets to a million receivers by transmitting once and then fixing the cases where they didn't make it because of radio interference. But we don't have that capability right now. There's a lot of things like that. How about strong authentication? We should have a lot more of that in the system we don't right now. You could do that. There's nothing about the protocols now that stops you from adding a new set of protocols or putting in new functionality or at least trying it out. Now, as to what's my life like, it's, um, it's weird in a way because I spent a lot of my time on policy, a lot of time talking to senators and congressmen and people in other, you know, in parliaments around the world, trying to, <laughs> trying to get them not to pass any laws until they have some idea of how the internet works. <laughs> you, know, you know, Senator, please don't do that again. You know, <laughs> uh, you know, having an internet comic book made, you know, you know that we can <laughs> give to the congressmen so that, and tell them, you know, there's a little final exam. You have to be able to at least understand enough about how the internet works so if you pass a, you try to pass a law that it has, there's a reasonable possibility it'll actually work. So I spent time on that. Lots of policy. The arguments in the Internet Governance Forum and the upcoming um, World Conference on International Telecom threatens the freedom of the internet because it potentially turns over control of the network to the uh, telcos and governments, leaving out the engineering community, the private sector, and civil society's seat at the table for policy. So ICANN, which is a multi-stakeholder organization, and uh, the Internet Governance Forum, which is also multi-stakeholder, patterned after ICON, believes that people who are affected by policy should have a seat at the table to say something about that policy. And intergovernmental negotiations don't do that. So I've been a noisy advocate of making sure that everybody who will be affected has an opportunity to say something about what that policy looks like. So I spend a lot of time on that. I'm in the research group at, at Google, so I get exposed to a lot of interesting things there. And I have a lot of other hats. Uh, you mentioned earlier, I was elected president of the ACM in July of this year. That's a two-year term. I'm, the, um, I'm at the Jet Propulsion Lab on a regular basis as a visiting scientist. Now, there are a bunch of other things that Google lets us do as part of our 20% time. Of course, my 20% time is kind of, that's a variable number, but, uh, <laughs> but they're very generous about that. And of course, I get exposed to a whole lot of young people at Google. And let me tell you the life lesson I learned from this. I get people running up saying, why don't we do X for some value of X? And I'll sit here thinking, you know, we tried X 25 years ago and it didn't work. <laughs> and then I have to remind myself, okay, that was 25 years ago. There was a reason it didn't work and that reason may no longer be valid. So it's actually timely to go and look and see whether X makes sense now. And I have to remind myself to do that. You know, otherwise, I'm just the old fart who says you can't do that. And the answer is you're wrong. No, I'm wrong about that. So that part's uh, a very um, it's a humbling, but it's also a very refreshing kind of experience. So life is good, uh, you know. <laughs> 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 there, there, I, I should tell you one other thing about this title, though. I was lecturing in Moscow. I was there for 10 days. Four times in public, and in the Q&A period, I was asked, do you believe in God? <laughs> <laughs> and my, the first time this was asked, I thought, wow, that's a personal question to ask. And they, they thought that Chief Internet Evangelist was <laughs> a religious evangelist. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought for a little bit, and I said, well, let me explain. I'm geek orthodox. <laughs> and they seem to be happy with that, so I'm sticking with that story. Okay, that's all the time we got. Thanks, everybody.